New religious movements appeared after the Second World War and had gained prominence over the past few decades. There's a good reason for their sudden rise in popularity and appeal. They meet a real psychological need for people who want purpose, meaning, and structure, things that these people otherwise wouldn't be able to obtain in other places. As technological advancements made our world bigger by the day, new religious movements provided an illusion of comfort in people by giving them decisive answers in an ever confusing world. In this state of vulnerability, it's no wonder why most spiritual leaders took advantage of it for their benefit, some of which took this to the extreme. It's the reason why the term new religious movements is widely considered as a euphemism for cult and is viewed with suspicion. Even if most of these new religious movements aren't violent, it doesn't help that some of them are propagating dangerous ideas and conspiracy theories. Furthermore, when criticisms were raised against these new religious movements, some of them would do anything to suppress it. Scientology was guilty in the latter. However, there's another religious organization out there that was well known to do both of these actions. Not only that, but they're also rich and influential, establishing their right-wing political party and group, as well as their anime films. All in the pursuit of their utopia. This is the story of happy science. Like almost Holocaust denier level stuff. Like they deny all of the bad history of Japan and their neoconservatives, they're terrible. I'm recording this video to respond to the hit piece put out by New York Times, which mocks happy science unfairly. Nakagawa Takashi was born in 1954 in the small Tokushima prefecture town of Kawashima. He was the second son of Nakagawa Tadayoshi, his father, and Kimiko, his mother. His father was greatly interested in philosophy and religion, and thus would lecture Takashi and his older brother Tsutomo on many diverse themes, including the Christian Bible, Marxism, and Zen koans. Despite Takashi's keen interest in world affairs because of his father's lectures, he's not as bright as his brother in school. This isn't to imply that he didn't try to address this problem. For a kid his age at that time, he understood that he had to put in a lot of effort to become a scholar or a diplomat when he grows up. That's why he worked so hard studying, so that he can improve his grades and probably his reputation in school. In the end, he successfully reached the top of his class. He was a happy boy then. This would soon change when in 1975, Takashi left for Tokyo to take the entrance exams for Tokyo University at the prime age of 18. Suffice to say, he failed, and it took him another year before he managed to slip in to the university's liberal arts school. Deciding to major in politics for one year after spending his first two in the liberal arts division, Takashi took a year off after his third year in university to prepare for these two tests. This gambit didn't work out well for him as he failed in both of them. This also meant that he can't continue his postgraduate studies at the university because his grades didn't meet the requirements needed to do so. After witnessing his dream of becoming a scholar or a diplomat dissipating right in front of his very eyes, Takashi would go on to join a Tokyo-based trading house named the Tomen Corporation, following a job that deviates far from his true passion. One could only imagine how shattered he felt at that moment. However, the feeling won't last for long. 
as he will experience his great enlightenment later on. One that will awaken his ultimate mission within him to the world. The official story from Happy Science goes as thus. On March 23rd, 1981, Takashi suddenly experienced a peculiar phenomenon, one that he will eventually come to realize as the beginning of his spiritual awakening. Suddenly, I sensed an invisible presence with me in the room and almost simultaneously understood by intuition that whatever it was, it wished to communicate with me. I ran to get a pencil and some blank cards. My hand holding the pencil began to move as if it had a life of its own. On cart after cart, it wrote the words, good news, good news, good news. I realized then that I had just experienced some sort of religious awakening, said Takashi. That was his defining moment in which Takashi reached his supposed great enlightenment at just the age of 24. The one who reached out to Takashi during that moment was a spirit named Nikko, a disciple for Nichiren Shonen. Nichiren was a 13th century Buddhist monk who was the central figure in many new religions in Japan. A week after Takashi obtained his great enlightenment, Nichiren himself communicated to Takashi, laying out the basis for Takashi's later teachings on love. Love others, nurture others, forgive others. Later in June, it was reported that a spirit of Shinji Takahashi went to visit Takashi. Shinji was a founder of the God Light Association, or GLA, one of many new religious movements that existed in Japan before Happy Science. Shinji's spirit informed Takashi that he had the potential to start a new religion. After the altercation, Takashi went out of his way to tell his friend Saburo Yoshikawa about it. Saburo seems to be ecstatic about it, even went out of his way to join Takashi in Tokyo. At some point, another friend joined in named Makoto Tomiyama. But there's a plot twist. These two turned out to be Takashi's own father and brother respectively, a fact that was made known to the public until years later. Together, both Saburo and Makoto will tape the interviews conducted with several other spirits that came to them. The spirits started off by writing with Takashi's hands before transitioning into speaking through Takashi himself. The list of spirits that were interviewed during that time were Nichiren, Takahashi Shinji, Kukai, Shinran, Confucius, Jesus Christ, Moses, and Nostradamus. For the spirits who don't speak Japanese as their first language, the story goes that they decided to speak to Takashi via a special device named the Powertron. This essentially allowed them to translate languages before they eventually got used to Japanese, eventually rendering the device useless. Before long, the words written and spoken by Takashi were the exact words of those spirits. How convenient. Anyways, despite all of these enlightenment episodes he experienced, Takashi ultimately decided to pursue a career in the Tomen Corporation. Takashi will eventually be sent to New York by the company for training, where he passed the Berlitz English course and started to take classes on the theory of international finance at the City University of New York. Three years later in 1984, he suddenly returned to Japan to serve in the Nagoya branch of the company. According to Takashi, the reason why he went back is that it was customary for potential future executives to serve there. However, there's more to this story than what Takashi would like you to believe. The reason why he returned to Japan is because of this. He was lagging behind in his class due to his proficiency in English not being good enough. The presence of a Taiwanese student who spoke fluent English only added insult to injury. In the end, he probably left because he can't take the embarrassment of looking less smart compared to his peers. Before he returned to Japan, he claimed to have experienced his second stage in the Awakening of Wisdom. 
he achieved this by reading more than 3,000 books, and I quote, like a silkworm devouring mulberry leaves. He reflected upon this massive amount of knowledge he obtained through this activity, and soon his feelings of embarrassment and inadequacy dissipated, replaced with what some may call a smug sense of superiority. On August 15, 1985, Takashi published his first book entitled Nichiren Shonen no Regen under the alias of Saburo Yoshikawa. This is to ensure that the higher-ups in Tomen didn't raise an eyebrow about what he's doing. A year later, between June 17th and 18th, 1986, several high spirits came down one after another to tell Takashi that it was time to devote his entire life to God's truth, which he eventually did. He sent a resignation letter to the Tomen Corporation a month later. After resigning from his job, Nakagawa Takashi took on a new name to reflect his spiritual awakening, Ryuho Okawa. He will later establish a new organization later in October called Kohoku no Kagaku, or in English, the Institute for Research in Human Happiness. For the sake of brevity, I'll just call it Happy Science for the rest of this video. This will be the foundation for the happy science that we know today. It was alluded to earlier that happy science didn't start as a new religion. Instead, it began as a graduate school of life with only four members at the start of 1986. The goal of this messianic study group was to investigate the principle of happiness through Ryuho Okawa's teachings on God's truth. Initially, the membership application for happy science was very strict, a far cry to how loose and liberal it is to join the religious organization today. One who wishes to join the organization had to read through at least 10 books from Ryuho Okawa. After that, one had to undergo a rigorous examination to gauge their zeal for the study group. Those who failed the test can retake it after waiting for as long as 6 months. This measure was effective, as this is a proven method of finding a perfect follower for Ryuho's organization, ones who are willing to fully commit all their time and money to the group's doctrine. Such people will be instrumental in shaping a devoted core for the organization. Weeding out the rest who don't show that same commitment would never be an issue, as they will at some point just give up. At the same time, Ryuho also wanted to attract more people into his organization, preferably those who were familiar with the new religious movement doctrine. To that end, he had to resort to being a clout chaser for the time being. All he had to do was name dropping Shinji Takahashi and Ama no Minaka no Shinokami in his first few public lectures. Unsurprisingly, some members of the Godlight Association and Seicho no Ie took a keen interest in Ryuho's lectures. It just so happens that these are the exact entities that these respective groups had special connections to. As a result, more people will come to know of Ryuho's teachings. To put things into perspective, Ryuho's first public spiritual lecture attracted 100 people. This number grew to 400 during the second lecture, and by the end of 1987, it reached 1,000 people. At that point, the halls that Ryuho gave his spiritual lectures in could no longer accommodate everyone anymore. But he was just getting started. Ryuho realized that solely giving spiritual lectures was not enough to chain people in the organization long term. Because of this, he decided to conduct a live-in study retreat program. This program would require selected elite members to live in close quarters and study Ryuho's words for days, followed by an intensive testing period, which was graded strictly by Ryuho himself. Graded qualification seminars were also held for members who wished to become instructors. The nature of all of these programs meant that a strong sense of identity and common direction was forged, and fervent absorption of Ryuho's thought through books and lectures was all but ensured. All that's left for Ryuho to do is slowly shifting his organization into a new religion, and declare himself the reincarnation of God.
Happy Science underwent major changes following the death of the Showa Emperor in 1989. Riho announced the unification of thought and religion declaration passed down to him from the God of the Earth, Lord Antonius. This was his first of a four lecture series aimed at intermediate and advanced members. By the time these lectures were fully published as Shinsetsu Hashodo, Ryuho claims to have received permission from the high spirits to spread his word to the rest of the world. To attract more people into his eventual new religion, some changes had to be made. These changes include holding frequent lectures outside of Tokyo, reforming the membership system, building a worship facility, and relaxing the difficulty of the examinations. These different measures helped increase the number of Happy Science members significantly. But all of these cannot rival arguably one of Riho's best move yet. Riding on the public's paranoia. Seven days after the Geneva peace talks, stealth bombers left for Baghdad. The Gulf War was about to begin. It was the year 1991, and all eyes are on the ongoing Gulf War. Many in Japan became increasingly anxious at the situation in the Middle East, as well as their future and Japan's role in world security. Sensing an opportunity, Ryuho decided to release two books in rapid succession, The Great Warnings of Allah and The Terrible Divine Revelations of Nostradamus. Both books heavily emphasized the prophecies of the coming apocalypse resulted by the Gulf War. And here comes Riho's riskiest play yet. He blew a large chunk of his organization's money to aggressively advertise these books. We're talking about an advertising budget that can cover most of the things we see every day, like television, newspapers, billboards, blimps, goodies, taxi bumper stickers, and so much more. Indeed. These two books are the Raid Shadow Legends of their time. It's everywhere, and you can't seem to avoid their annoying slogan that goes, Now is the age of Kohuku no Kagaku, or Happy Science. This time, Ryuho's gambit paid off. His books sold like hotcakes for months, which translated to millions of copies sold. It was no surprise why both books dominated the bestseller list for the first half of 1991. There were corners dedicated solely to Riho's written works interviewing spirits in bookstores. He had finally made it to the major leagues. He finally got the public to talk about him and his teachings. With him finally making bank, he was able to establish his publishing firm and organize larger events in stadiums. Speaking of which, Happy Science's first major event in July 1991 boasted 40,000 attendants at the Tokyo Dome Stadium. During this event, Riho had finally come out to announce his transformation from a mere spiritual medium to a supreme deity of this world. The one who stands before you is Riho Okawa, yet it is not Riho Okawa. The one who stands before you and speaks the eternal God's truth is El Kantari. It is I who possess the highest authority on earth. It is I who have all authority from the beginning of the earth until the end. For I am not human, but am the law itself. Now, this is the part where it gets convoluted and confusing, but I'll try my best explaining the core beliefs of happy science. There's multiple academic papers and articles detailing the core beliefs in happy science, and they certainly did a better job at it. I'm just a university student majoring in computer science, so take this as a rough idea of what happy science is from an outsider's perspective. According to 2015 Happy Science group profile, it states, Happy Science believers have a strong faith in the God of the Earth, El Kantari. He is the existence whom Jesus Christ called Father and Muhammad referred to as Allah, and a part of him was born as Sakyamuni Buddha. In the Old Testament, El Kantari was known as Elohim, and he also represents the Tree of Life in the ancient legend of the Tree of Life. All religions originally come from one source, El Kantari, the being that designed this world with love. A part of El Kantari resides within Master Okawa, and is guiding humanity to create a world of harmony and prosperity. 
According to Riho, he is the incarnation of Alcantari, the highest being in the ninth dimension originated from Venus. Alcantari comes in many forms of personal gods and fundamental divinities throughout human history, collectively known as divine spirits. Each of these divine spirits have their own backstory, and it is as crazy as you imagined. Here's my personal favorite I found out of the bunch. One of these coveted divine spirits was claimed to be Allah. Apparently his real name is El Ranti or Al El Ranti. Don't know how the Quran could miss that one, but okay, sure. According to Riho, Allah was the one responsible for the creation of the Garden of Eden. How did he do that? Well, he guided a group of 60 million aliens from the planet Beta all the way to Earth using their UFOs. When these aliens landed by the Nile, the first utopia was established. At some point, Allah supposedly went back to heaven, and together with Jesus Christ, also known as Amor, became the principal guiding spirits to King Lamu, the leader of Atlantis. I really do wish I'm making this up, but I'm not. But okay, we get to know a bit about their core beliefs. What about their teachings? There's two basic teachings of happy science. The exploration of the right mind and the fourfold path. The former dictates that all of us are the children of God, and thus there's a bit of that divinity in within us. The path of true happiness can be achieved by seeking that divine nature, whatever that means. As for the latter, there's four principles of happiness in happy science love, wisdom, self-reflection, and progress. Put the pin on the first and the fourth principle. This will be important later on. Now, as universal as happy signs are at the surface, most of their teachings were based on Buddhism. After all, he did go on record saying that he is the reincarnation of Buddha. However, this move was initially met with scathing criticisms by scholars, the media, and even the death cult due to how widely misconstrued Riho's earlier interpretations were on most of the Buddhist teachings. And that leads us to the next act. Happy science may have achieved its golden age in 1991, but that doesn't mean that there were no detractors criticizing Riho and his cult. These criticisms levied against happy science will be the catalyst to the Friday Affair and the bitter rivalry with a notorious death cult in Japan, Aum Shinrikyo. For now, let's focus on the former. The Friday Affair refers to a legal dispute between happy science and Kadansha, a publishing company based in Tokyo. The story goes that one of the magazines published by Kadansha named Friday allegedly published several libelous articles against happy science. Friday is a weekly magazine dedicated to spilling the tea on celebrities' private lives, as well as some other nice stuff. On August 9th, 1991, an article appeared in the 23-30th August combined issue of Friday, giving details of Riho Okawa's alleged visit to a counselor from whom he was supposed to be seeking advice for a mental condition. It inadvertently casted a considerable doubt in the reader on Riho's fitness to give spiritual guidance to others. But there's a plot twist. Whoever was spilling this tea got the names and people all mixed up. It turns out that Riho never went to this counselor in question and thus had nothing to do with them. Needless to say, the journalists who concocted the story done goofed big time, and because of this controversy, Happy Science came back with vengeance. Outraged by the blasphemy committed by Kadansha, followers of Happy Science started organizing protests outside of Kadansha's office for weeks. Meanwhile, workers in the Kadansha office cannot conduct any business for several days as followers of Happy Science constantly telephoning and faxing their grievances to the company. At the same time, they also held rallies around Tokyo, calling for the banning of the Friday magazine and the resignation of the Kadansha CEO that time. Eventually, Happy Science decided to file a lawsuit to Kadansha on the grounds of defamation in the Tokyo District Court. And if that wasn't bad enough, some 3,000 people, 
where followers of Happy Science filed their own lawsuit to Kodansha for mental anguish, citing that the articles published by Friday about Ryuho Okawa had resulted in the injury of their faith. But that didn't stop Kodansha from filing their own countersuit, seeking reparations from Happy Science for disrupting their business. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any articles addressing the resolution to this legal case. But at least Kodansha and the Friday magazine is still in operation till this day. You know, it's hard to sympathize with Happy Science in this case, as the things that they have done leading up to the trial was completely unnecessary. Here comes the part where I bring out the second pin into this, and you'll see why. Progress. The progress is always blessed with genuine feeling of happiness, and real success is spreading this happiness to many. We are trying to create an ideal world by increasing and developing the cycle of happiness. One of Happy Science's end goal is to establish an ideal world, or a utopia, a place where everyone was blessed with genuine feelings of happiness. However, with all of this Kadansha fiasco that had happened, it raises an important question pertaining to their imagined utopia. Does that mean, in the pursuit of Happy Science's utopia, that any dissenting speech against Happy Science would be removed and censored? Will those who raise their voices of dissent against Happy Science be hounded by the adherents for weeks on end? Will there be any free speech in this utopia, and what does free speech actually mean? To happy science? I suppose we would never know of these answers. Not that raising these questions would change anything. Either way, I'm sure they're not going to like this video one bit. But I'm still curious. I guess there's only one way to find out the answer to one of my questions. We shall see whether or not happy science will strike this video down, or do it much worse than that. It's always a reliable litmus test, albeit a risky one. Kodansha wasn't the only headache that Ryuho had to solve. He also had to contend to the criticisms and death threats from one of Happy Science's rivals, a death cult named Aum Shinrikyo. To understand how the rivalry came to be, we have to understand the context. This entire saga began before 1991 when Ryuho called the leader of Aum Shinrikyo, Shoko Asahara, a frog. This is in reference to Shoko's way of performing his aquatic yoga. And I guess because of that incident, Shoko just became quite salty at Happy Science in general, particularly towards Ryuho Okawa. In response, Shoko lambasted Ryuho for having so little knowledge of the things he preached, especially when it comes to the Buddhist terms and concepts. It's important to note that Shoko's accusations was not entirely baseless. Unlike Ryuho, Shoko was familiar with Buddhist scriptures and doctrine, and despite being a crazy murderous loon himself, he was so confident in his knowledge about Buddhism that he was willing to go on a televised debate with Ryuho. To the surprise of nobody, Ryuho declined to be on television. Later on, he quietly revised many parts of his doctrine and core religious books just to make sure nobody lambasted him again for his inept understanding of Buddhism. But tensions kept rising between these two rival cults. What started off as an exchange of insults between two spiritual leaders so full of themselves eventually turned deadly. It got so bad that Shoko intended on assassinating Ryuho Okawa. This was months before Aum Shinrikyo committed the infamous Tokyo subway serene attack in 1995. However, it was believed that the assassination plot was exposed to the Tokyo police in advance. Seeing that the authorities were closing in on him, Shoko Asahara decided to hasten his plan to execute his ultimate terrorist attack. And the rest is history. With that inhuman act, Japan was plunged into a state of insecurity not experienced for decades. It was rush hour when the sarin gas began to spread through Japan's subway system, released from plastic bags onto five crowded trains. On March 20th, 1995, news broke out about the Tokyo subway serene attack. It shocked the entire nation to its core. 13 people had died in the attack, 
and more than 6,000 of them were injured. Some of them even lost their vision. The wake of this tragedy had completely changed the public's perception of the new religions and cults, as the public now views them as a potential threat to Japanese society as a whole. Happy Science was no exception. They also bore the brunt of the public's sudden hostility towards cults because of this incident. It doesn't help that before this incident, they were knee-deep in some damning scandals with several magazine and newspaper outlets. The way Happy Science chose to respond to these controversies only made things worse, which is where the comparisons with Scientology came from. All of the criticisms and scandals that Happy Science had earned before this incident forced them to enter a period of consolidation, not only of its organization, but also of its teachings. But despite their declining popularity amongst the Japanese people, it wasn't all too bad for Happy Science. It can be speculated that their membership was still growing, albeit at a slower pace after the Tokyo subway incident. It's hard to tell the rate of growth and the exact number of people who do adhere to Happy Science today, because I find it hard to believe in their official records that claimed 11 million people subscribed to this cult. Ask the people around you, your family members or friends, and they most likely say that they never heard of this cult before. Nobody around me knows what Happy Science is until someone in the comment section mentioned this cult. And this is me coming from a country which used to house the highest number of Happy Science lodges in Asia, four to be exact. Now it's three because I think one of them got closed down. But maybe we don't have to scratch our heads for long. Ryuho's ex-wife, Kyoko, might have a rough idea of the actual membership count in Happy Science. She placed her estimates around the ballpark of 30,000 people. That's a few zeros missing from what the cult claims to have. I guess it's a little wonder why Kyoko got cast out of the cult and demonized as a result. Maybe she got her act together once she realized that maybe Riho is not the kind of person he claims to be. But you know who else had the same idea? Ryuho's own son, Hiroshi. The same person that was supposed to be Ryuho's successor once he expires. Imagine how that must have felt to see your own son ridiculing the nonsense you've been peddling out for years. That must have been very embarrassing to Ryuho. And the only comeback that Ryuho can come up with his family problems is that both his son and ex-wife are demonic. Really now? Happy Science may have still been rich and influential to this day, but its golden age has since passed. Their accolades were no longer reported extensively by the Japanese media because they realized that all it did was giving Happy Science free publicity. And the last thing the media wanted was to be labeled an extension of Happy Science's public relations arm. As Ryuho found Happy Science in a state of stagnation, the next step he took was to expand outside of Japan. Ryoho's plan of actually expanding his cult to the rest of the world comes when they're facing some difficulties in Japan. Granted, this was probably already planned when they're still popular in the public eye. However, the tainted reputation Happy Science had earned and the stagnation of their popularity in Japan necessitated them to branch out immediately. And so he did. Happy Science had opened temples and branches all over the world, from New York to Bukit Jalil and London to Kampala. He even went out of his way to go on tour in various places to attract people into his religious organization. It was a success on Riho's part. While almost all of the Happy Science branches did their own thing and tried not to attract a lot of unnecessary attention to themselves, some of the branches did the exact opposite of that and made a bunch of noise. And you bet that I'll talk about it. Before we address this issue, let me take this opportunity to bring up the first pin that we've set up earlier. Love. True love is to give to others, 
not to take from others. Just by practicing this giving love, the gates of heaven will open up before you. So, why am I making this point seem so important? Well, did you know that Happy Science has done some things that can come off as homophobic? I know this is a bold statement, but hear me out. On January 25th, 2019, the Liberty Web, owned by Happy Science's publishing arm, posted an article entitled, Why Freddy Couldn't Go to Heaven. This article was referring to Freddie Mercury, the lead vocalist in the rock band Queen. One of the known facts about Freddie is that he is bisexual. Unfortunately, the article doesn't even try to hide their bigotry, as the more you read into it, the more it reeks of wine. Supposedly, Freddy's spirit was interviewed by Ryuho Okawa, and here's what his spirit allegedly said. Did I suffer from AIDS because God was punishing me for being gay? Tell me, why have I lost my way after death? Promptly, Ryuho summoned a spirit of Zoroaster, a Persian god for his thoughts. And let's just say that his comments aren't the nicest one out there. He was even quoted saying that the current global trend of supporting the LGBTQ plus community is a mistake and ought to be punished. So of course Happy Science had to say something about it. But all they're doing at that point was validating this bigoted worldview that there's a risk that the LGBTQ plus community is sliding into extremism. The fear that stems from a possibility that if they became an absolute power, censorship to those who oppose the community will be rife. A point that is completely nonsense. You do realize that the LGBTQ plus community has suffered a lot from blatant bigotry and discrimination for decades now, right? Even though a considerable portion of society has shifted their mindset to be a bit more empathetic to this community as of recently, they're still suffering from prejudice. And it's gotten worse, especially in the United States when that orange man was still in office. You know, the same guy that Riho claims to have been living as George Washington in a past life? The truth is, there's a lot more to be done for the LGBTQ plus community to be safe and not getting ostracized for being who they are. This article makes it seem like the only reason why Happy Science fear for the so-called censorship is because they don't want people to call them out if they get caught being bigoted. It's cool that they say that they accepted the LGBTQ plus community, but their concerns are just baseless. If anything, they should be more wary of the extremism against this vulnerable community. See, Happy Science preach about love a lot, yet they unintentionally display a degree of unfair prejudice against a community that was oppressed by the society for decades. And that doesn't sit right to me. While we're on the topic of censorship, I do find it bitterly ironic that Happy Science fears for censorship if the LGBTQ plus community becomes an absolute power, whatever that's supposed to mean. Yet, they were known for censoring news outlets or magazines for writing critical articles against Riho or the religious organization itself. And of course they didn't just stop there. Why would they? They went out of their way to put a researcher named Fujikura Yoshiro in legal trouble for taking pictures in their public place of worship. And for what? Because he constantly wrote critical bot posts against you? Why are you doing this to yourself, Happy Science? What's wrong with you? On April 16, 2020, the New York Times published an article entitled Inside the French Japanese Religion That Claims It Can Cure COVID-19. The article reported on Happy Science's extraordinary claims of having a cure for the novel coronavirus. They achieved this by using two methods. The first method is by listening to Riho's lectures about the coronavirus on CDs or DVDs sold by Happy Science. The idea is that listening to his voice can greatly boost one's immunity against COVID-19. The second method is to introduce rituals that can cost you up to 400 US dollars to protect you from the coronavirus. Spiritually. Does this surprise you at all that all of these involve you forking over your hard-earned cash to happy science. They even sold a book about it for heaven's sake. Sure, they're not coercing anybody to buy their stuff, but the fact that they decided to sell these things to begin with is kind of questionable. 
From the way I see it, they're not doing this out of charity. It's an opportunistic way of making bank out of other people's fears and anxieties, just like what they did when the Gulf War erupted in 1991. There's no scientific evidence out there that can prove the effectiveness of these two methods. And most likely, we won't be having any because everything about these claims is not grounded in our understanding of science today. It's just so ironic, since the word science was blatantly used in their name, yet we couldn't even observe, measure, or even analyze these supposed miracles. And the nonsense didn't just stop there. I'm sure you're already familiar with the QAnon conspiracy theory. I have to look this up because I'm not familiar with it and here's what I got. With the aid of a small group of military intelligence officers called the Q-Team, President Donald Trump is waging a shadow war against a cabal of Satan-worshipping, child-eating, um, uh, Jared Fogel, who are conspiring to obstruct and overthrow him. Okay, that was some wacky stuff right there, but did you also know that there is a Japanese counterpart for the QAnon conspiracy theory, simply known as Jayanon, and that Happy Science was one of the main proponents of Jayanon? On January 5th, 2021, Happy Science co-sponsored a pro-Trump demonstration in Tokyo Shibuya District. Out of the estimated 1,000 to 2,000 protesters attending, some of those were prominent and senior members of Happy Science. It was noted by Yoshiro that this protest specifically seems like a different groups were collaborating together as a sort of Jayanon all-star team, all brought together by Trump. There's a lot of reasons why Happy Science in particular has a vested interest in supporting Trump. But to put it simply, it all boils down to how similar their political ideologies are, especially when it comes to their opinions about China. In their eyes, Trump seems like the type of person that would fight valiantly against the evil communist China. Seriously, it's a whole nother can of worms to open and I'm not in a position to be explaining this topic in detail on my own. If you want to know more about cults, extremism, and ways that people should combat it, I highly recommend you checking out Asuka Wilde on Twitter. She's been researching about this topic for years, and I'm sure that whatever curiosities you have in mind about the relationship between happy signs and the aforementioned conspiracy theory, she can answer it best. Check her out, her Twitter link is in the description below. Okay, it's time for the finale. Let's see what Happy Science has to say about the New York Times article. As you can probably tell, Happy Science didn't take the article about them too well. The New York branch of Happy Science made a response video objecting to the lies that were being put out by the New York Times. So, let's break this video down and see what's wrong, shall we? I'm recording this video to respond to the hit piece put out by New York Times, which mocks Happy Science unfairly and contains more than a few mistakes and lies. The Minister of Happy Science of New York, Yushi Hagimoto, started this video off by committing a logical fallacy of poisoning the well. Right off the bat, Yushi claimed that the article on Happy Science is mocking this and misinformation that. And he hasn't even addressed the article in question yet. It's easy to be swayed by such fallacious tactics if you aren't paying attention. But once you recognize it, it's easy to dismantle your opponent's arguments. Moving on, he wants to set the record straight by denying the claims that Happy Science is a doomsday cult. The article entitled, Inside the French Japanese Religion That Claims It Can Cure COVID-19, conveys the false image of Happy Science as a doomsday cult, which is not the fact. The core teachings of Happy Science, represented by such notions as the fourfold path, aim to realize true happiness both for individuals and society as a whole by practicing the laws of the mind. The teachings, which are presented in such core texts as the laws of the sun, are that of authentic religion and clearly differ from doomsday thought. Even if we decided to ignore both of the books published by Happy Science during the Gulf War, which, may I remind you, contain elements of doomsday prophecies in it, None of that can explain why this story from Happy Science exists. Let me read this one other article addressing this point. 
Dermedia, however, has a strong and controversial central theme. According to converts, the coronavirus is not a naturally occurring phenomenon, but rather the result of a bioweapon incident instigated by China. The communist virus, they claim, is a product of the trade war caused by the non believing Asian superpower. As such, the pandemic pits Western theistic states against agnostic China. The New York Times explained the details of Happy Science's conviction. Okawa has purportedly recently been in touch with extraterrestrials and the spirits of Chinese leaders. These spirits informed Okawa that the virus was initially created as a bioweapon and shelved by the Chinese government, but later released by a UFO to punish the Communist Party. However, religious followers need not worry because the coronavirus can be defeated by a belief in the El Cantari deity. If you pay attention, this story also has doomsday themes plastered all over the place. You got this cataclysmic event taking place with an intricate conspiracy level backstory to boot. It's affecting everybody, and a lot of people are going to die because of the pandemic. But of course, there's always a cheat in the system. All you have to do to save yourself is placing your belief in El Cantari to eradicate the communist virus for good. It's so easy that we don't even need actual vaccines from the likes of Pfizer and Moderna to do just that. How convenient. After the outbreak of the novel coronavirus infection, Happy Science has been offering as much support as possible from the spiritual perspective as its religious mission. Happy Science does not conduct its activities for the sake of monetary gain. No, no, no. You're doing this for monetary gain. You would think that the right course of action to help people is by giving them spiritual vaccines for free without asking anything in return. I never would have thought that the savior would still want mere mortals to give him money as thanks. Who would have guessed? While respecting the value of contemporary medicine and scientific discovery, it teaches the ways to protect people from virus infection from the spiritual perspective. It is taught at Happy Science that people's immunization can be strengthened through the power of faith. People can strengthen their immune system by deepening their faith and prayers. Mocking people who conveys the words of God and who piously pray to God is a blasphemous act. Really? You do know that not everyone believes in blasphemy. You want to know why? Because religious organizations tend to use this excuse to weasel their way out of criticisms every single time, even when they rightfully earned it. It restricts questions, criticisms, or ridicule of religion or religious concepts, and it is by design authoritarian. You should heed this excerpt that I'm about to read here because I think it will serve you well in the future. While freedom of thought and belief, including religious belief, must be protected, it is equally important to guarantee an environment in which a critical discussion about religion can be held. There is no fundamental right not to be offended in one's religious feelings. Religions, per se, do not hold rights. Churches and religious groups should be open to hearing criticism, just as every group in society. Intellectual and cultural events rely on the free exchange of ideas. Protecting any ideas from criticisms does them no favor. It allows them to survive unchanged without being adapted and improved. While the article presents the claims of people who oppose the happy science one sidedly, all their claims are lies. And Happy Science has published seven books to prove their false assertions with concrete evidence in Japan. In Japan or Japanese, even if either one of these two conditions were true, it wasn't really helpful to us, is it? If these books were only sold in Japan, then how do you expect us to get our hands on these books? And if these books were in Japanese only, then how do you expect non-native speakers like me to understand? This point is just not good, and I have no idea why you included this to begin with. 
Happy Science has also filed lawsuits against individuals for their defamation against the organization. The cases are in dispute now in Japan. Of course you would include this point. Why am I not surprised? Making subtle threats against a journalist who wrote the piece, hinting at a possible lawsuit. It's so on brand of Happy Science to do this, isn't it, Yushi? They did this several times to shut people up. I don't have to repeat myself again about what you did to Kadansha and Fujikura Yoshiro in the past. If this doesn't reek of pettiness to you, then I don't know what is. This response video was just poorly made and has no redeeming qualities whatsoever. And the thing that aggravates me the most is how on the books this response is. It's so easy to dismantle their arguments and Happy Science probably knows this. It's also probably the reason why they love dishing out lawsuits so much. Why not? They have the resources and money to do this all the time. It's so petty. It says a lot about these self-proclaimed religious organizations if they can't even stand up to scrutiny without resorting to silencing people, much akin to a dictator that Riho so much despised. It's pathetic as it is shallow, and I can't believe that a god like El Kantari could be this fragile and sensitive. It's never too late to get out. I get it. Life before you cross paths with a cult was hellish, and I can only imagine how it must have felt to be so lost and empty inside. But I just wanted you to know that this is not the way. You don't need a self-proclaimed spiritual leader to dictate what you should and should not feel, to tell you what is fact and fiction. They fooled you into believing that you can find your worth by being one of them, promising an illusion that at a glance, seems so real. Deep down, you probably had known that something was not right as you spent more time being with them. But you suppressed those feelings, believing that a demon inside you tried to sway your faith away from your savior. You just don't want to feel lost anymore. You've had it enough. It's okay to feel this way. It's okay wanting to be somebody that mattered for once but you can never find it here in this cult. All you're doing is helping to stroke one man's inflated ego. The truth is, he's just like you and me, an ordinary human. He never possessed any godly features and he was never there to save you. He's only there to take advantage of your vulnerable state. You're worth more than being constantly used by an opportunist. You are born free and you can never let them take that away from you. You are strong. <laughs>